Uh, hello, everybody from Salt Lake City, Utah. Um, I do direct the Scientific Computing and Imaging Institute, and we do pronounce that the Ski Institute it works really well in, in Utah. And uh, we're one of the uh, the university level interdisciplinary uh, research institutes on, on this campus. So before telling you a little bit about the institute and some of the research, I wanted to uh, give you a bit of history, because most people don't know uh, about how computer graphics was, a lot of it was, was created at the university. So the people on this, uh, this slide are uh, people that have changed the world in uh, computer graphics. So in number one, that's David founded our Department of Computer Science back in 2005. And the first guy he hired was the was number two, which is Ivan Sutherland. Ivan had created the first computer graphics uh, interactive system called Sketchpad. He would later win the Turing Award for his work in graphics. Number four is the third faculty member, Tom Stockham. He was the signal processing guy who created um, the CD-ROM, among other things. And then those three faculty, with a few others, um, created this amazing environment by which they trained these graduate students in this new area of, of visual computing, and they would go on to do amazing things. So like John Warnock, who is number three, John uh, did the hidden line removal algorithm for his PhD thesis. He then co-created uh, PostScript and then co-founded Adobe and was the president of Adobe until just retiring recently. Uh, number five is Ed Catmull, and Ed got his PhD here in Utah. Um, he then uh, co-founded Pixar, and he's still the president of Pixar and now Disney Animation as well. Number six is uh, Alan Kay. He invented the uh, laptop computer and also object-oriented languages. He won the Turing Award a few years ago. Number 10 is uh, Nolan Bushnell, and uh, Nolan created Pong, the first video game. He then founded Atari sold Atari for a couple hundred million dollars in the 1980s, and then he founded Chuck E. Cheese Pizza Time Theaters, which have been very popular in the US. Um, number eight is Jim Clark. Jim Clark founded uh, Silicon Graphics Incorporated, SGI, and also Netscape, and many others. It's, it's kind of amazing just to, uh, to think about this place in the mountains in Salt Lake City where uh, a lot of computer graphics started. So these are the uh, faculty within the Ski Institute, uh, regular faculty, and they come from multiple departments. So computer science, electrical computer engineering, bioengineering, mathematics, and uh, most of us have multiple uh, appointments in other fields like physics and genetics and radiology and et cetera. And the core research areas within the Institute are scientific and information visualization, uh, biological, medical, and geophysical image analysis, and then scientific and biomedical computing. And we spend a lot of time and think it's important to take our research ideas and make them into really usable open source software. So we have over 30 software packages that we offer on our website as uh, open source, and because some folks have actually found them useful, we've had five spinoff companies uh, over the years from the Institute. And these are the uh, the national U.S. centers that we direct, the research centers, give you an idea of the breadth of the uh, research. So I direct this NIH, National Institutes of Health Center for Integrated Biomedical Computing. Valeria Pascucci directs a, a, a DOE Center for Extreme Data Management Analysis and Visualization. Chuck Hansen and I, we uh, have an NVIDIA Center of Excellence. Martin Berzins and Mike Kirby direct this uh, Department of Defense computationally Computationally Designed Efficient Materials Center. We have a center for neuroimage analysis and also one for computational earth sciences. Uh, and all of those have the strengths of uh, scientific computing, visualization, and image analysis. We're part of a lot of other centers as well. Okay, so let me get going on the uh, my presentation. Um, so this is one of my favorite slides uh, by Lesk and Landauer where they try to figure out uh, characterize how much data uh, we were creating. And uh, this is a log scale. Um, so all of these lines on here are really exponential and linear scales. And uh, the left axis is, is an exabyte, so 10 to the 18th bytes. And they started to try and just how much data had the world created. And so they made a back of the envelope computation that if you added up all the books and film and et cetera over 
the entire history of human race of 40,000 years, it would be about 12 exabytes. And then there are a few things that you see happening. So around 2003 was the first time that if you added up all the, the data that was stored in the world, that it crossed over that line of what we had created up until then for the last 40,000 years. And then in 2006, it was new data, just the new data that we had created in that one year now was more than all of our 40,000 years um, previously. And in this last year, um, we created um, that many uh, thousands of exabytes of data, and it's now every other day we create as much new data as we did from the beginning of mankind until 2003. So if you feel like you're over inundated with data, you are. It's only going to get worse. And really, this really poses, I think, some of the great challenges, scientific challenges for our century in terms of, of how do we understand this data? How do we move this data? How do we store it, archive it? Um, how do we make the best use of all of this data that we're creating? So while you've had some other uh, speakers that probably mentioned exabytes, I thought I would uh, tell you uh, how much an exabyte is. I have a hard time just thinking about, we now talk a lot about exascale computing and exabytes for in high performance computing, but most people don't. So I tried to get a, give people a better feel for it. it was how many trees does it take if you were to print out an exabyte? So an exabyte is about that many pages of standard printer text. You can find out um, that in a tree farm that creates, creates pulp for paper that, that uh, one tree can produce about 94,000 pages of a book. And so if you do a little math, you can find out that it would take about 530 billion trees to print out one exabyte of data. And then you might ask yourself, well, how many trees are there like this in the world? And of course, someone has counted them. And uh, in, oops, oh no, hit the wrong button, sorry. All right, go through. Oh no, <laughs> I'm applied malfunction. All right, I knew that it's there, so I'll put it up here just for, hope you can see it. Um, so in 2005, there were about 400 billion trees on Earth of this size. And so roughly, you can create, you can think about if you use all the trees in the world, it would store one exabyte or print out one exabyte of data. And now we're, we're creating thousands of new exabytes and beyond uh, of that amount of data. So just kind of amazing. All right, and so what do we call all this data these days? Well, we call it big data. And uh, Dan Airely was uh, visiting us last year, and he is a social economist at uh, Duke University, and he had this nice quote about, about big data, which I liked. And uh, he has the coolest name, I think, of a research center, and he heads at Duke University, the Center for Advanced Hindsight, which I thought, that's a great center. Okay. So what, how are we going to actually figure out what to do with this data and understand it? Well, here's a simplified version of your brain. And uh, it's broken up into the percentage of your brain that's used for each of the senses. And you'll see that your visual um, image processing part of your brain is about half of the volume of your brain. So we are very, very visual creatures. It's also the fastest um, part of your senses of your brain then touch, then hearing and smell, and then taste. Um, and so it, it makes some sense that if we can find ways to create good abstractions, good mapping from this, this large scale, often complex data, that that might be a reasonable way for us to, to understand such large amounts of data. So on this slide, you'll see some visualization techniques that are abstractions and mappings for different applications. And the upper left is a visualization of the largest um, simulation of, a, of a creating a spiral galaxy by a, an astrophysicist, Elena Dongnia, was at Harvard and now at University of Wisconsin. She had created, uh, done this simulation, but it was multi-terabytes of data, and there, she had no visualization, there was no program. She could just pop it in and look at it with. 
she was here giving a talk in our physics and astrophysics department and heard about us and came up and visited and asked me if I thought we could visualize her data, and I said yes. And uh, the next week, I got a FedEx package of multi-terabytes of her data, and uh, we read it in, and what we're using here is a parallel ray tracing system by which we're uh, rendering the primitives of each of those stars, and yes, there are billions and billions of those stars, and we're using mapping physical uh, characteristics in terms of the speed and their location and the light reflection on each of the billions of stars. The, the next one over to the right in the middle at the top is work with some material scientists who had created a new polymer foam. And they asked us, they wanted to do this compaction test and they wanted to be able to visualize the stress tensor from that compaction. And so we had to come up with a way that's just one instant in time of that uh, dynamic compaction stress tensor. The, the next one, the top right, that's uh, one of Jacqueline Chen's uh, large-scale combustion. So Jackie does some of the, uh, the largest combustion simulations on the largest DOE machines in the U.S. And uh, she's trying to figure out how to make more efficient fuels. And that's one time instance where you see a volume rendering that is looks at the, at the 3D um, uh, 3D full visualization, um, <coughs> mapping the the different colors to temperature, and then off to the left you see these dots and lines. That's a topological analysis where we're looking at extinctions and uh, and the starts of the new flames. And so we're what they really want to know is to follow a track at every point in time to be able to look at these, the, where flames start and where flames extinguish. And so I'll say a little bit more about that later. In the middle, you'll see a video uh, visualization using streamlines of a large scale simulation of the magnetic field of the sun. The lower uh, left hand, you'll see these kind of bubbles going through. That's work from Valerio Pascucci, who is one of my faculty and work with fluid dynamicists, and they were trying to understand how they could compare um, the simulation models as well as experimental results from going from laminar flow to turbulence. And Valerio spent five years of his life working with these guys, um, these people, uh, and figured out a new topological analysis where he could actually count the numbers of bubbles when there was a transition to turbulence. And they were able to experiment, uh, link this to the experiments. It was a big paper that was published in, in science. A few more, we've got in the middle some um, combustion, uh, again, fire simulations of a jet uh, fuel fire. In the upper left, we have uh, confocal microscopy visualization from Chuck Hansen, one of my colleagues, uh, looking at the paw of a, uh, of a mouse. And more and more, we are seeing that in addition to the large-scale scientific 3D spatial visualization in time, we're seeing these high-dimensional informational spaces where you don't necessarily have the 3D spatial, but you have very high-dimension, large-scale um, data. And there you're really trying to find these patterns and correlations, often using interactive techniques to understand your data. So along the bottom, um, we have uh, examples of genetics, uh, molecular biology um, and, uh, and other biology. Uh, right above in the left middle is an epidemiology um, <coughs> disease model and an additional. So these are just examples of the kinds of visualization techniques that we are working on. So let me give you some case studies. This is Watson and Crick um, in a photograph uh, from 1953 uh, in which they had worked for years to figure out their, uh, the structure of DNA, they won the Nobel Prize in 1962. And this is their abstract three-dimensional visualization, their model that they looked at and played with hours and hours and hours um, to be able to come up with that structure, uh, blending theory and experiment. Certainly today, biologists all over the world um, use three-dimensional visualization in order to understand these structures. Uh, what's interesting now, too, is because of 3D printing, they can print out those structures and go back to really looking at the full three-dimensional uh, versions in physical space as well. This is uh, my most famous colleague scientist at the University of Utah. It's Mario Capecchi. 
he won the Nobel Prize in Medicine or Physiology back in 2007. He figured out how to knock out a gene in a mouse, which has really changed our world. Um, this is one of the PR shots from the uh, University of Utah. It was taken in our visualization lab, which is why I like it. And in the back, that's actually one of my former PhD students' head, uh, Dave Weinstein. So we, we, we kid Dave that he's the brain behind Mario, at least in this picture. So some of the work that we did with Mario um, is about image-based phenotyping. And it's basically, now that you can knock out any gene in an animal, in a mouse, how do those gene changes instantiate themselves into the physiology? And one of the ways he's used, do, trying to figure this out is through imaging and visualization. So what you see here are uh, a couple of mice. The one in the middle is an 18-day-old embryo of a normal wild-type mouse. It's a high-resolution micro CT scan. And for size purposes, that's smaller than your little fingernail in, in real space. On the left is the knockout. There's only one gene difference between those two mice. Uh, they're the same age and otherwise only differing by one gene, and that's a PAX3 gene knockout. It controls musculoskeletal development. So Mario's question to us was not, how do I compare the skeletons of these two mice, but how if I take uh, the wild type and their uh, a population and their normal distribution and the knockout and their normal distribution, how can we compare these databases of images uh, in a quantitative way. And uh, we have created some visualization and, and uh, image analysis work to do this. We've got the cover of PLOS Genetics, which is nice. But it really opened up a whole new research area for us because it was an outstanding problem in image analysis. And it basically was, the, the statement was you have a, a set of thousands or millions of, of images, say you have brain images, and you first need to be able to answer the question, what is an average image? And it's a lot harder than you think and a lot harder than just adding up pixels and dividing by, by N. And uh, so those guys at the top are my image analysis faculty, Sarong Josie, Ross Whitaker, Guido Gerrig, and Tom Fletcher. And they won the David Marr Prize a couple of years ago for figuring out how to solve this problem. Um, they had to create new mathematics to do it. They, they mapped it into a nonlinear space they were able to find these translationally and rotationally invariant metrics by which they could measure distances in this nonlinear space. And then they were able to say something statistically in a quantifiable way um, of what the differences were in these big databases of images. So they had a statistics of shape and connectivity. And, and that is one of the, the significant ways in which we were able to apply it to Mario's mice. It turns out that you can apply the statistics of shape to a lot of really important and interesting problems. So one um, really important problem is that is finding physically based or any kind of, of, of biomarker for neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and autism and others. Currently, there exists no physically based biomarker. So you, there's not a blood test to figure out if your child has autism or, or a parent has Alzheimer's. Um, it's often uh, behaviorally oriented. They'll look at some image scans. There might be some indication of something there, but um, for example, if a child is suspected to have autism, they go to an autism clinic, spend the entire day there taking tests, and then they, they're placed at the end of the day on some spectrum of uh, autism disorder. Um, what these guys did, they, they made a big name uh, for themselves this last year with people at UNC and Mayo Clinic and others who had done a, um, a prospective study of having MRI scans of, of babies um, over uh, the span of multiple years. And a certain number of those children developed autism. And what these guys were able to do was to use this technique um, not knowing which ones had autism or, or didn't, but to, uh, to go back and predict with high confidence uh, back to two months of age which of the children had autism spectrum disorder and which of them were normal. And while this is not a, a cure for any of these diseases, but getting the patients into a treatment plan earlier often leads to a better quality of life. So we're really excited about this. We're also working with uh, anthropologists and archaeologists on dinosaur bones, figuring out which ones go with what, and 
and artists and sculptors about what uh, uh, sculptures can be attributed to what artists, all kinds, shape is really important. Okay, shift gears here and talk a little bit about volume rendering. We've done some fundamental work in the field of volume rendering and volume rendering is about how do we have a three-dimensional, we have three-dimensional scalar field data, it can often be images, but it can be any scalar field data. How can we pull out interesting features um, and phenomena in that 3D data and present it on a two-dimensional graphics screen? So the standard volume rendering techniques that are out there really just use one-dimensional trans so-called transfer function. So transfer function is the function that takes the data and uses color and opacity to basically filter out what you're interested in seeing or not seeing. And most 1D transfer functions just look at, for example, the image intensity. Um, and you can get, you can look at things that kind of look like x-ray images when you use that. Um, it turns out that 2D is better, but it's not as good. And if you go to 3D or higher, you can get these, uh, you can pull out all kinds of additional information. So what you're seeing is just a CT scan of a tooth, an X-ray of a tooth. And just by changing that three-dimensional transfer function, we can pull out all kinds of different features inside. So a system that we've created around this, um, both for multi-dimensional transfer functions and for really large-scale data. So this currently holds the land speed record for being able to interact, really volume render the largest amount of data in the hundreds of terabytes of data. It's called ImageVis 3D, and it got Jens Kruger and Tom Fogel up there um, are the main creators of this. And uh, this is an open source software that you can you can grab off of uh, off of our website. And let me give you my favorite example of using this. So this is the National Institutes of Health Visible Male. He's the most famous dead guy in in image uh, image processing, image analysis. So he was a convicted murderer in Texas, which in the United States is, in the world, is not a good place to be a convicted murderer. So he was, he was executed. Um, before he was executed, he donated his body to science, and uh, after he died, uh, the NIH came in and then scanned him at the highest resolution of all the scanners at the time. At the end, they uh, froze the body and put a color camera on top and then uh, took a photograph, milled a millimeter down, another photograph, etc. And they put all of his data online for researchers to use. So he became the first gold standard for human anatomy. Um, and thousands of, of research projects and, and papers have been written using his data. It's really amazing. Um, one of the challenges, though, is that the data was so large, it was so high resolution, and especially the color photography data, that no one could visualize the whole thing. Uh, interactively. And so what most people did is they got the data and it's large and so you downsample the data and you got a lot of images that look like this. So we popped this into our images 3D uh, system and because we could interact with the full highest resolution data sets and we had these multi-dimensional transfer functions, we found out that this guy was covered with tattoos. So what you're seeing here is uh, not a photograph, but you're seeing a volume visualization of the ink in the skin. And if you think about, and this is from the photography data set, so if you think about our input data is just a set of 2D photographs, and that we were able to pull out the small scale feature of the ink in the skin. And there, people had worked on this data for 10, 15 years, but um, most of them had no idea that he was covered with tattoos because when they got the data, they downsampled it. And this is such a small scale feature. If you think about how, how ink is showing up in a 2D slice uh, and how small that is in your skin, that basically just they couldn't see any of the tattoos. But uh, you can, if you have a high enough resolution screen, you can actually see some of the red and blue in the flag and it uh, s says mom across his chest. So that was pretty cool. And this got us to really thinking about uh, what we're doing with our data because the, the, it's so almost automatic that we take large data and the first thing we think about doing is reducing the size of the data or we're doing dimensional reduction. And uh, you have to be really careful when you're doing that, especially if your data set uh, consists of small 
features that might be important. So this is some data from Jacqueline Chen from Sandia National Laboratory, one instant in those combustion uh, data sets. So each of her time steps is four terabytes in size. And she does thousands of time steps yielding petabytes of data. And, and then she wants to visualize it and interactively if possible. And nobody could really do that. Um, and so people down sampled her data sets. And we were able to finally be able to interactively visualize those highest levels of data, and we were able to compare it with the low uh, resolution data. And she's interesting, interested in these react, mixing of the reaction, reaction scalars, um, which is an important feature within these combustion data sets. And they show up here as, as the peaks and valleys of these kind of contours that you're seeing on the screen. And you probably don't have high enough uh, screen there to see, but on the left-hand side, there were features that were non-existent that actually then showed up in, in the high resolution. And perhaps even more disturbing, there were some features in the low resolution that disappeared when we had the full high resolution. And so we started to think about, well, there's got to be better ways to come out, out of this data um, and deal with this. And, and that's led us to what I mentioned before are this, this topological analysis that Valeria Pascucci's um, uh, team works on. And what you'll see are, are those, these little dots. Some are light blue, some are, are dark blue, and they are the ignition and the extinguishing of the flames at one instant of time. And so we then take that, and we can do the full volume rendering to look at 3D physical space, but then we also map each of those time instances for the extinctions and the ignition on a two-dimensional statistical graphic. And then we can watch and, and connect how one goes from the other at every time instance. Uh, and then Jackie can then play this over time to watch and the, the, uh, how these flame fronts are, are starting to ignite or how they die off, et cetera, in our studies of the different fuel mixtures. So we've also spent time taking this, uh, these types of visualization systems and make them, making them run on portable devices like iPhones and iPads and soon Android devices. So what you're seeing here is a, uh, uh, a full volume rendering with full lighting and shading uh, using the CPU and GPU of the iPhone. And that's a, a, a 256 cubed uh, data set of an x-ray scan of a hand and I'm old enough to know that that not too many years ago that would have cost you like thirty thousand dollars to get a graphics workstation that did that and now you're carrying it around in, in your pocket which is amazing um, and so one of the applications that we have going on using portable visualization is from Chris Butson's lab Chris is a bioengineer one of my colleagues here he uh, directs this uh, Center for uh, Neuromodulation Research, and it's about stimulation um, and uh, stimulating the brain, stimulating the spinal cord. And one of the things that he's been working on is in deep brain stimulation for movement disorders. So for people with Parkinson's disease, where they have this tremor, um, there's a time when the medications can wear off, and because of that, they uh, basically can't control their tr tremors. And the, uh, they can't eat, they can't feed themselves, they can't drink, some of them can't walk. Um, and it's been, it's been recently discovered that if you stimulate the right place in the brain, you can break this circuit from recurring and restore their normal, normal movement. And uh, to give you a sense, here is an example of, the, um, of this amazing... Phenomena. So this is during surgery. You can see the shaking of the cup. They're now stimulating the patient's brain and trying to find the place in the brain where it actually breaks that circuit from occurring. And then when they get it right, it's like magic. It's like a miracle because now he's going to have full motion back to lead his normal life and be able to drink and eat and things by himself. It's just kind of amazing. So where we come in in this uh, process and where Chris Butson is doing is figuring out after the surgery, um, they have to optimize uh, the, the stimulation. So they close the brain back up and then the patient heals for a while and they come back and they connect a, uh, a stimulator to them 
and then they, they try different uh, voltages and different stimulation electrodes places in order to optimize the, uh, the effect. You can see in that middle picture, that's what two of the electrodes look like and how deep they go in the brain. And then along those, those stimulation electrodes are they can stimulate at different pat places with different voltages. And so what Chris does is that he takes and does, uh, creates images-based models physically from the brain's heads of the patients, lines up where they've implanted surgically the stimulation. Then he runs uh, finite element simulations on uh, every stimulation point and every possible voltage. And then we've created a, spe a special images 3D that the neurologist can use um, in order to see where they might want to stimulate. So in the past, it, it used to take uh, multiple hours because they would just do this in a, in a start with a electrode one, stimulation site one, voltage one, and watch. And then go to voltage two, watch. And it would just be this uh, um, just uh, brute force way of trying to figure this out. Um, from Chris's uh, simulations and visualizations, in the uh, initial studies, the neurologists were able to optimize in less than five minutes. And uh, so he's just received a large NIH grant now to do a nationwide clinical study with partners at Stanford and Mayo and uh, the University of Florida and Cornell, where they will be now using this system uh, with their patients. So it's really, it's really exciting. Okay, let me go to another example. And this is again a combustion example, but in a different way. Um, there's a lot of applications in science and engineering that have high dimensional data that cannot be viewed in that, in that dimension. And this is 10 dimensional data uh, for different uh, types of fuels. And what most scientists do is they, because they can't figure out how to visualize 10 dimensional data, is they take each of those dimensions and look at them over on time. So what you're seeing on the right are some of the 2D graphs of each of those dimensions as a function of time. And then they look at those for long periods of time and watch them, and they try to figure out and create something in their brains. Um, uh, and it's hard and often not successful. This is Ross Whitaker and Valerio Pascucci, two of my colleagues, and they've created a three-dimensional uh, visualization by which they can represent all 10 dimensions of that, of the uh, combustion data. And what they were able to find is they actually were able to find something new that the combustion scientists didn't know existed by looking at their simulation and experimental data. And uh, I think I've got a little video here. Oops. Turn down this the, uh, the volume here. So here the, you've got 10 dimensions on the, uh, the left and we're, we're pulling this in to look at the three dimensions and you'll see uh, this ring that goes back and forth and that's where you're looking at all 10 dimensions at one time. You can see them change on the graph onto the left. And, uh, and so they now for the first time were able to physically explore all 10 dimensions uh, simultaneously, which was really cool. So this has now been used for a lot of different applications um, uh, in many different science and engineering applications. All right. So this is a, a brand new uh, system that I've worked on with one of my former PhD students, Hanwei Shen, who's now a full professor at uh, Ohio State. I say that because he's now had like 15 PhD students graduate, so I have many academic grandchildren by him. And uh, there's an unsolved problem in visualization, which is how do you visualize dense 3D vector and tensor fields? Um, so streamlines, as you see in general, you can see something on the top, but you can't see what's in back of them. And we've created this deformation uh, system by which we can either interactively go in and pull away things uh, to investigate our data, or we can, uh, if we have some analysis that we have, for example, vortices, we can actually compute and say, show us the vortices. And the system will basically go in and then pull apart the, uh, the system so that you can look inside and see the, the specific um, interest area that 
you have and still see what's around it in the global context. So you're seeing these details within context, um, but not you're not obscured by all of the, uh, the fields that are around it. Uh, and so these are fluid dynamics uh, examples. And we also have the same problem when we're looking at um, diffusion tensor imaging for medical images. So this is a diffusion tensor, a DTI, of a patient that has a brain tumor. And these, uh, the connectivities that you're seeing there are very important because they often are the carriers of, of uh, the information, the electrical signals to different parts of your brain, and they connect the different senses in your brain, body movement, your hearing, your sight, etc. So the neurosurgeons do not want to cut through those, um, those diffusion tensor images or those uh, white matter tracks that are there. And so this is a way that they can explore the surrounding tracks um, while still being able to, to uh, see where the, uh, where the tumors are. So we've worked now with some neurosurgeons and neurologists and have an updated version that uh, we'll continue to work with. Okay, let me show you some interesting art. Uh, this is uh, uh, work, work from Mark Lavoie. So Mark Lavoie uh, from Stanford and also Google. Uh, a few years ago, he somehow convinced the Uffizi Museum in Florence to give him full access to Michelangelo's David statue there. He set up a high-resolution um, uh, laser scanner system in which to triangulate the uh, entire uh, statue at submillimeter resolution. Um, and then he uh, gave out the data to the visualization community and said, well, can anybody actually visualize all of these polygons? And we won. Uh, this is some interactive visualization of seeing the, the data. We can look at different times of the day where the sun, when the statue was outside, um, uh, to be able to look at it. And our video was actually uh, in the Uffizi Museum for a while. What's more amazing, though, is that uh, this last year, he scanned the statue at much higher resolution. So now we're, he's at about almost a billion little triangles. We're going to zoom into that same place in the eye that you saw previously. And at this resolution, you can't see an individual triangle. You can see defects in the marbles. You can see little cracks. You can see the sculptor's marks. But you can't see individual triangles. The data is just amazing. And uh, this is what the Uffizi Museum was after because they wanted um, the highest resolution model that they could ever get of the statue in case something happened to it. Um, now that they have it though, Mark is not allowed to share the data anymore with people and we're only allowed to show a certain number of views because if you had a big enough 3D printer, you could print yourself out your own Michelangelo's David statue. And uh, it's the Uffizi Museum's intellectual property, and they do not want you to be able to do that. They want to be able to do it if something happens to the statue, but not you. So, uh, so that was pretty cool. One of the things that we found that uh, few people know because they can't get close to the statue anymore is that in the back of one of uh, David's legs is uh, somebody has carved their initials. You can see on the left leg, kind of in the middle, M N. Um, where uh, probably some teenage kid, when it was outside, decided to carve their initials into the statue. You cannot get that close to the statue now <laughs> to do that. Um, we have also just released a, uh, a new iTunes app uh, that works on your iPhone and your iPad, and it's called Gigapixel Dave David, and uh, it's free if you want to take that. And it shows you four different views that we're allowed to show you, um, and at uh, at the resolution, the highest resolution, and you will be able to interact with it because of this data streaming system that Valerio has created called Visus that uh, is, does this really interesting um, uh, both caching and also data structure that enables the, after the pre-processing for you to be able to look at these images. The images I just showed you were actually two gigapixel images, each frame. So not megapixels like your phone, but gigapixels. That's how high resolution they are. All right, let's move to another big image analysis uh, problem. This is the highest resolution set of images of the, uh, the part of the brain for the visual cortex, the retina. 
and uh, it's it's taken by one of my colleagues here um, in uh, the Robert Mark Lab, and it's part of the the worldwide project called the Connectome, where they're using mosaic to electron microscopy in order to try and come up with a fundamental wiring diagram of the brain. So researchers, neuroscientists at different places in the world are doing this technique on different parts of the brain, and then the idea is that once they each have the, the wiring diagram of their own little piece, they'll all get together and put it back together and have a full wiring diagram of the brain. Okay, well, the uh, it's harder than that. So you see these stair steps off to the left. I, I don't know if you can see my mouse or not, um, but the, the little stair step, that's the highest resolution of just one of those um, uh, electron microscope images. That's 4,096 pixels by 4,096 pixels along one of those little sides. Um, remember that your HDT, HDTV is only about 2,000 by 1,000 pixels. Uh, so it's, you know, fit in there really, really nicely. So they now have this amazing system that cuts off um, the smallest, thinnest piece of the brain, uh, images it at the highest resolution, and then dumps the data. Slice, image, dump, slice, image, dump. And this thing runs 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And uh, when it comes out, it doesn't quite look this nice. So my colleague, image analysis, uh, faculty member Tolga Tazizan has a way to register all this data. When they get done just with a single slice, it's 200,000 pixels by 200,000 pixels at a resolution of two nanometers per pixel, two times 10 to the minus nine per pixel. Wow, okay. And then they do the next slice. Well, it turns out that they can't slice nearly as thinly in the depth like that as they can do the mosaic imaging across the XY. And so you can see that even though they're trying to slice very thinly, that it changes quite a bit. Um, and so it's a real challenge to do the, the neuron tracking through these data sets. Um, uh, and when they get done, just one little, little piece uh, is 16 and a half terabytes. Uh, per volume and the way that we get this data the fastest way we get the highest bandwidth is we get in our car we go up to Robert Mark's lab we take his disk out and then we drive back to our lab and put it in our disk because uh, it's so much data and they're now they are now prepping a system that each one will be over a hundred terabytes um, each little set of volume images and then they say okay we'd like to interactively visualize this for us and I put Lee Winock hook under here because I kind of feel like with Robert Mark and with the ability to interactively visualize, it's, a, it's like a new microscope. So Lee Winock was one of the innovators of a light microscope many years ago, and he discovered a lot of new science because he could see things at resolutions that no one else could see. And we can take that entire data set, um, 16 and a half terabytes, and put it over our, uh, our power wall here, which is 36 30-inch monitors, and interactively visualize all 16 and a half terabytes. And because they had never seen, no one had ever seen the data at this resolution, they found new structures and new science. They were writing articles for Nature and Science and Cell and Neuron, and uh, they were very excited. Um, just to give you an idea of what just one cell type through that data set looks like and how complex the connectivity is. Here's uh, a version. And that's just one cell type. When you add all the cell types in there, it's just entirely packed. Our brains are so complicated. And remember, this is just a very, 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 very small piece of the retina, <laughs> let alone the rest of your brain. So it's going to be interesting to try to put this all together. And now that they can do this, they also want to do all kinds of simulations, like how many of these cell types, what about this particular um, uh, propagation of, of the neurons, the electrical activity? What about the biochemistry? Which are all now supercomputing problems because the size of the data sets are just so enormous. Okay, let me switch gears to some information visualization. This is Mariah Meyer. She's one of my young visualization stars. Um, she is, does things a little different uh, than a lot of the visualization researchers that you might uh, bump into, where many people are technique driven and they have a new technique and they might offer you some a, uh, a, a package or something or a more general purpose package in which you have to figure out how to get your data somehow, file format changes into that 
uh, format in order to look at your data. She does it entirely different. She basically works directly with her uh, collaborators in this sense, in this case, biology, biologists, geneticists. And she goes in and she reads their papers. She interviews the researchers to find out what their goals are. She watches the, the researchers using the tools that they have now and what works and what doesn't work. Um, and then she goes away and creates a prototype visualization interface just to solve that particular problem. And, and then she puts it back in their hands, has them use it, gets feedback, goes back and does another prototype. And this rapid iterative prototyping, prototyping takes often months and even sometimes years. But at the end, the researchers end up having a tool that is just designed for them to solve their particular problem. So here are four examples of Mariah's systems. And you'll see they look different, and that's because they solve four different biological problems. Let me give you one example. So this is work that's uh, out of uh, a comparative genomicist lab at uh, the MIT and Harvard Broad Lab. And they're interested in finding a model that could compare human chromosomes on the outside ring with different mammalian species and represented by the inside ring. So this was the first time the researcher was able to look at their model data in Mariah's system. And those kind of uh, the, the bunches of red and green are correct, but all the stuff in the middle is wrong. And so they knew they had a problem with their model. They went away for months, and then they came back, and this was their updated model. Well, that's better. But at this point, they understood they had something fundamentally wrong with their model, and they went away for months again. And after a lot of iterations with Mariah's visualization system, this is the, uh, the system that was verified experimentally and then published. And Mariah asked the, the geneticist how long he thought it would have taken him to get to this point without her visualization tool. And he said, honestly, I don't know if I would have ever gotten there. Now that's just such a great example of people working on parts of a problem where neither of them could have solved the problem by themselves, but only by working together could they solve this important problem. And it, it shows this, the power of visualization and analysis um, to be able to do this. And uh, also to just give you an exam, an idea, um, let's see, do I have to push this? Maybe, uh, yes. Um, interaction is really, really important uh, for this. And so what you've seen are just some stills, but here's how, what it looks like when the scientists are actually you know, using it and interacting with it. And, uh, and so there's a tremendous amount of interaction that goes around for looking at patterns and correlations and comparing with data uh, that happens while, this is, while the scientists are working on this. Okay, let's see. One more little topic and then I'll open it up for questions. Some of my own research has been uh, in trying to figure out how to visualize um, uncertainty. And I always ask people, when's the last time you've seen an error bar in a 3D visualization? And the answer is almost never. So I use this example to tell you, to motivate why this might be important. This is a, a data set, uh, a MRI data set, where a person has a large uh, tumor there. The standard way we visualize those tumors is we segment each of the slices and then we create an isosurface, um, which you see represented in green on the left. What you don't see is any indication of any kind of error or uncertainty. And this is bad for two different reasons. One, surfaces play a really important role in our perception. Um, it's how we navigate our worlds. We assume if we see something 3D surface, it's true. Um, so it's overemphasizing the truth by showing it as, as a surface. And then by not having any indication of uncertainty, it also overemphasizes the truth. Well, let's look at the data. I don't know how well this will show up on your, your screens, but this is the left side, and it actually is fairly good that you could find an edge to that tumor. But if you look at the right-hand side, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to see what's going on. So if you take different, a range of different segmentation algorithms, these are the extent of those algorithms. So you can see on the left-hand side that it's a very tight 
um, uh, bound. And you could then say, we have uh, high confidence that our isosurface or segmentation is, 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 uh, is correct or certain on the left-hand side. But then on the right-hand side, you, it, it, we have much less uncertainty. And so where do you tell, if this is your brain, where do you tell the surgeon to cut? Well, let's get it all. Let's take the inside blue um, band. No, let's leave a little extra brain, take on the outside, and maybe just do the average. Well, these, that's what they have to make decisions on um, every day during this neurosurgery. And what we should be doing is not telling them where to cut, but basically just saying, we think we have more certainty over here, and we think we have less uncertainty over here, and so you need to use that information to make your best decision. And so we've been spending a lot of time trying to figure out uh, ways to characterize and visualize uncertainty. This is a system for the diffusion tensor imaging um, where we have, uh, we're looking at different models of the, uh, the diffusion tensor uh, that have been proposed and being able to compare them and also along with a phantom. We have an interactive system that goes through and uh, the blue color shows that there's, an ac there's high accuracy between the model and the phantom. The uh, red or anything off blue shows uh, high error. And then we also do statistical histograms that you can look at different parts of the brain. This is a really great example, I think, of the, the need for this by Hans Christian Hage's group out of the ZIB in Berlin. If you've ever seen fluid dynamics uh, work and some of the visualization uh, for complex flows, they often show these topological skeletons where they look at critical points of sources and sinks and, and other transitions. And, uh, and then they look here, they're using line inter convolution to look at the transitions in those between the different critical points. That one on the upper left though, that's uh, a mathematical no error, no uncertainty. It doesn't really exist except in mathematics. And so what Christian's group did was start adding error and uncertainty to the critical points and then visualizing those topological skeletons as he added more and more error. And you see that it looks not a lot alike, and that's the upper left-hand corner, but it's probably a much more honest and uh, realistic representation given certain amounts of error and uncertainty. We've also done some work with uh, visualizing probability density functions and I'm just going to skip through here and using volume rendering for uncertainty. Um, this was a fun one that I did with uh, using Turing's models of reaction diffusion and spots to be able to, uh, to then weight one of the attributes um, with uncertainty. It actually didn't work that well, but it made cool screensavers. Um, we have a, another, one of the things we found out when we were doing this research is that um, there's already such a complicated system, and and oftentimes your your sense your visual system is overloaded, and so you're now going to add something else in addition to the you know into the scene. And the people were starting to focus on the uncertainty part we added in, and not the actual good data. And so it's like no no no, we want you to look at the good data and just know that that uncertainty part is there. And so we created this lens system where you could, you could turn it on and off, and you could just move it through your data to be able to look at it uh, and much more effective. All right, let me just finish up here. And uh, these are the uh, half smiling faces of the 200 uh, at the Ski Institute. Many of those are hardworking PhD students from multiple departments that did a lot of the work that, you, that I'm showing here today. These are our productivity machines. Um, we have five espresso machines in case four break down. <laughs> We also have uh, a ping pong table in uh, our reception area. It's amazing that it, it turns out that ping pong is like the international nerd sport. It's like students from every country, they know how to play ping pong. And so we have a institute ping pong tournament every year that's uh, highly uh, contested. Uh, and here are the nice funding agencies that funded uh, the work that I got to show you. And if you have any questions, want to follow up with downloading software, we have all of our papers online as well. Uh, there's the website, and there's my email if you have specific questions. And with that, I'll thank you for your attention. Thanks very much. <laughs>